start by thanking you all for coming here and for joining us tonight. Uh, this is an evening to celebrate Angie Cohen and all of her accomplishments since she came here and engage both uh, between us. This, uh, this evening is in the form of a dialogue between Angie and I on the future of Israel studies. We're going to have a 45 minute to an hour dialogue and then we'd love to open it up to a broader conversation with you. Um, my name is Sabrina Parich. I'm a, an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology. And over the past three years, I've had the great pleasure and privilege of being Angie's postdoc supervisor. Though the amount of supervision Angie needs is very minimal, and the things that I learned were many. I'm grateful to both Angie and to Jenny Beltsberg for providing me with this opportunity. And I would especially like to celebrate Jenny Beltsberg's contributions to this university tonight and thank her for everything she has done to advance Israel studies here. So if you can join me. Um, so Dr. Angie Cohen, I want to give you a little introduction, is one of the most successful postdoctoral associates we have hosted in the Faculty of Arts. She has not only been an exemplary academic researcher, but a mentor to our undergraduate and graduate students, and a connector between the university and various communities in Calgary, including Calgary's Jewish community. Since arriving, and this is where I give you a bit of a, a list of all of the amazing things Angie says done, uh, since arriving, Dr. Cohen has published five journal articles, not including articles that are still in press or in process. She has nearly completed a full draft of her monograph, Memories That Serve Life, Autobiographical Narratives of Spanish Moroccan Jews in Israel and Argentina, and has secured a contract for this book with McGill Queens University Press. She has also been awarded an Insight Development Grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for her new project, The Voice of the Mothers, Feminist Reclaiming of Jewish Tradition Among Sephardi Women in Israel, which you'll hear, be hearing about tonight. Dr. Cohen is the first postdoc at the University of Calgary to be awarded this grant. Marginalized in the field of Jewish studies and within the anthropology of religion as a whole, Sephardi women, when portrayed, have been contained within idioms of religiosity and the trappings of Orientalism. Dr. Cohen's new project will examine Sephardi women as ethical subjects formed relationally through their practices, family, religion, and outside of the home as well. While much feminist scholarship has traditionally resisted the idea of religious subjects as agentive as having their own agency, Dr. Cohen's ethnographic research seeks to decouple feminist theory from secularism. Her current and future contributions are in critical part of Jewish feminist scholarship. Sephardi women's experiences and feminism have remained largely unaddressed in research, but Dr. Cohen is charting new pathways. Despite the pandemic, Dr. Cohen participated in major international conferences all over North America, in Israel, and in Morocco. Along with Dr. Yuval Evry at Brandeis, she organized a hugely successful speaker series on Sephardi modernities, which registered over 1,500 attendees over her three years here, many of them repeat attendees who attended all of our events over the three years. It brought Sephardi and Mizrahi scholars, writers, and musicians together in a forum the likes of which have not been seen here. The speaker series was co-sponsored graciously by the Calgary Institute for the Humanities and Brandeis University. And in Alberta, Dr. Cohen's talks, her film screenings to local Jewish communities about her research and about Sephardi culture and feminism have been prolific with numerous talks at Beth Tzedek, the Jewish Historical Society of Southern Alberta, Hillel Calgary, and Hillel Edmonton, which were great student events I had a lot of fun joining in with as well. Throughout this, Dr. Cohen participated richly in the life of the Beit Midrash Avivot in Jerusalem, whom she will be partnering with for her next research project. What I have mentioned so far really barely scratches the surface of Dr. Cohen's accomplishments. Dr. Angie Cohen is a rare scholar who will not only conduct innovative research and write impactful scholarly work in her future, but she is a tremendous public intellectual. We are grateful to have hosted her here and contributed to her work, and I am grateful forever for her friendship. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Angie Cohen.
So we're going to engage in a bit of a, a discussion. Angie and I have kind of talked through some of these issues a lot over the past three years um, and present this as a conversation. Um, so we wanted to start off with the question of Israel studies and what exactly is Israel studies? Sometimes it's almost easier to define Israel studies by what it is not. Um, it's not an area defined by one discipline. I've seen people who are in film and religion, anthropology, history, archaeology, who are Israel studies scholars. While the word Israel is the title of the field of studies, um, Israel studies scholars also understand that Israel as a state is a composition of transnational histories, including those of Spain, of Morocco, Argentina, and many others. Israel studies scholars are also known for not simply studying what happened after 1948, but rather the many dynamics and factors leading up to the establishment of the state of Israel and afterwards, the trajectories of different Zionisms and the trajectories of many migrations, uh, communities in Ottoman and British Palestine, and the geographies of the diaspora since. There's a great Ladino expression from amongst Balkan Jews that describes Israel studies to a T. I love this expression, prasa y calabazas, which translates to leeks and pumpkins. Um, it's a mishmash. It's something you throw together in a burek when you are trying to empty out your fridge. It brings together everything and everyone, and it's a delicious dish made by your nonas. So I guess to speak of Israel studies for me is to open up transregional, transnational, but also multilinguistic and multidisciplinary possibilities. What is Israel studies to you? Well, first of all, thank you, Sabrina, for your generous introduction. And before we start, I want to say that my time here would not have been as productive or as meaningful uh, without your relentless support. You have not only been the best mentor one could have, but you have also become a very dear friend. So thank you for that. <laughs> I also want to uh, say thank you to David Berkison for having welcomed me here and for having always, always been there. So thank you. I want to say thank you to Richard Sergutson for her, his um, support and for his interest in everything I was doing. So thank you for that. Thank you to Marika Cassis for her enthusiastic support of my course um, and for her friendship. And finally, thank you to Jenny Belsberg for making all this possible. Now back to the question of what, <laughs> what is, is Israel studies? What is Israel to studies to me? Yeah. So, first of all, I think that to think about Israel is to think about a multicultural and multilingual reality. And as such, the field of Israel studies is equally diverse and home to different disciplines in the social sciences and in the humanities. There used to be a predominance um, of political science, but that has changed in the last years. And it's more and more common to come across research that focuses uh, on the diversity of Israeli society, being the internal ethnic conflict, on non-official narratives about Zionism. Um, more specifically, there is a growing interest in Sephardi and Mizrahi history as part of the field of uh, Israel studies, and it's becoming more and more common to find classes on Jew, uh, Jews in Islamic countries and their relation with Zionism and, their, and Arab nationalism and colonialism. The tensions in the process of definition and Israeli identity in the context of the country's multiculturalism, Mizrahi culture in, in Israel and the ethnic conflict, etc. So Israel studies is a field uh, where different disciplines meet to study Israel from a variety of perspectives, looking at different time periods at different geographical areas, different populations, and different cultural phenomena. So it is, by, by definition, a transnational and transcultural field. I mean, so this is, this is really great. I love the start to the conversation. Um, but I think one of the things is that people might have a lot of assumptions about what Israel studies is or what it could be. Hmm. For sure, yeah. So I think that when one thinks about Israel, Israel studies as a field, without knowing much about it, one probably has a number of assumptions. Um, one is, for example, that Israel Studies is an advocacy platform. Um, however, 
just to give an example, the Association for Israel Studies, which has existed for over 35 years, uh, just issued a public statement about the current political situation in Israel, which they define as one of, I quote, growing support for racism and incitement, referring to the current ultra right wing government and their judicial reform plan. Israel Studies then is an academic field where Israel society is analyzed and studied, um, including aspects that may be uncomfortable for many. Uh, we are witnessing an, an increased inclusion of perspectives and disciplines that approach a question that was almost taboo not, not very long ago, the intra-Jewish ethnic conflict and its direct relation to today's deepest social schisms in the country. Another common assumption about, at this time about Israel, is that Israel is a Western bastion in the Middle East, that Israel is the Europe of the Middle East. Um, this is certainly how the Zionist pioneers um, understood their job. This is, I mean, we, we know how Theodor Herzl himself thought of the future of Israel as a European wall against Asia or as, quote, an outpost against barbarism. Decades later, Ben Gurion himself um, spoke about the importance of creating a European culture in Israel. However, when we look at today's Israeli society and today's um, demographics, we see that the majority of Israeli Jews are actually descendants of Jews from Arab and Muslim countries, today called Mizrahim. In order to understand today's social split between Mizrahim and Ashkenazim and between the government and their detractors, um, we need to look back at the first decades uh, after 1948 and see how the economic and cultural elites were established. Who got the highest positions and who got the lowest? Based on this assumption that Israel was and had to be a European country. And I guess you specifically mean a Western European country, right? Because oh, yeah. clearly the Southern Europe was not no. the model <laughs> no. for, for Israel. No, um, it was not. Can I, I want to ask you a bit of a follow-up, because um, you've talked a couple of times about this idea of a social split mm -hmm. today in Israel. Um, are you speaking about the split between Ashkenazim and Mizrahim in Israel? Is that what you're talking about? Can you explain that a little bit more to us? So the split that I'm, that I'm speaking about right now is the one that we're all seeing in the news every day. Um, with a government that wants to basically overhaul the judiciary system, leading to the massive protests we keep seeing uh, in the news. This has deepened a social split that was already there, which, had, which is also a social class and ethnic split that is not clear for many non-Israelis. So if we want to understand what's happening today, what we are seeing today in the news, we need to look back at the period leading to the establishment of the State of Israel and the first decades of its uh, existence. If we do that, we'll see that by the end of the 19th century uh, through the 1930s, there was a well-established Sephardi intellectual elite li living in the Yishuv, in the Yishuv the, is the, the, the free state um, settlements, which re really, with really critical actors like Abraham Shalom Yuda, uh, Yosef Meyuchas, Eliyahu Eliashah, who imagined a Jewish state whose point of reference would be Al-Andalus and the Arab Jewish past. The rich Arab Jewish tradition, instead of imagining a, the Jewish state as a European country where the European diasporic Jew would be finally free uh, in the style of Herzl. For these Arab Jewish Sephardi intellectuals and activists, the long Judo-Arab history could serve as a model for the future of Israel and Palestine. I am telling you this because I don't think that many people know that in the 1920s or 1930s, the model for the Jewish state was still not defined. And there were many actors trying to influence what this was going to look like. Needless to say that the Sephardi option was the road not taken. And instead, the model of the new Israeli was the model of the new Jew uh, that um, the European Zionists proposed. This new Jew that would be brave, would have no past, and would be a rejection of the diaspora. 
this new Jew as a model of citizen uh, not only did not work for Sephardi and Israeli Jews who had no interest in being new Jews, uh, but it also didn't work as a model for Holocaust survivors and, and it, it didn't work as a model to heal. Um, but that is another very long story that I don't think we can get to tonight. So I want to I wanna follow up on this. So you suggest that the Sephardi model for statehood, a specific Sephardi understanding not only of the past, but of political organization is forgotten yeah. and displaced. So what happens after 1948 and, and what, what happens to those ideas? So yeah. those are the first, after 1948, those are the first decades of the state, which largely organized the political map as we know it today. Um, if we look back, we'll see that the political, cultural, and economic elites are Ashkenazi. Um, and we will find uh, statements um, issued by Ben Gurion saying things like, we need to uh, prevent the Levantinization of Israeli society that could potentially come with the mass arrival of um, Sephardi Jews from Arab lands. So there was a real fear that Israel would become a quote unquote an Arab society. Um, and this was a problem for many, many Jews, many Jews who actually came from, uh, Air, from Arab societies. We will also find if we look back at those first decades that there was, we could already see the beginnings of today's situation, which is that Mizrahim um, are overrepresented among the lower classes um, and they are overrepresented among the, um, the right wing supporters. If we put two and two together, we will then see that there is an ethnic element and a social class element to the voting dynamics. And today we see the government saying that they are going to reform a judiciary that is basically a, an Ashkenazi liberal club. This, this message is not, not everybody that doesn't speak Israeli understands, but if you, if you hear the, the government speak, this is what they're saying. And to whom are they talking? They're talking to Mizrahim. Why? Because Mizrahim are their voters. And why are there the, 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 the why are Mizrahim their voters? Because Mizrahim feel that the left could never represent them because the left was directly responsible for their the, having low social mobility in the decades after the establishment of the state. So the left, in turn, continues to see Mizrahim as primitive, as uh, uneducated, as conservative, and Mizrahim continued to see the left as a white man's club. So the, then if we want to understand today's split, we need to understand this dynamic because this is basically the message that the government is sending. We are here to stop this protectia, as they say in, uh, in Hebrew. I think one of the things that comes out really clearly from what you're saying is actually the need for a concerted revival of, of Sephardi intellectual and political history Go that on. is critical in research and in Israel studies moving forward. That's a missing element it is, in uh, this yeah. picture. Yeah. Yes, it's, yeah. it's a huge missing element. And that is why I cannot emphasize enough yeah. the importance of bringing Miz uh, Mizrahi history and Sephardi history into the field of, uh, of Israel studies. Because otherwise, there is a huge part of the picture that is missing. Yeah. Um, and that is critically important, not only to understand the present of Israel, but also to imagine a different future. Yeah. Uh, if we want to imagine a different future, we need to start telling different stories uh, about what Israel is and about the, the very history of Zionism. So I want to connect these things that you've been talking about, these new research avenues of research, to your time here at the UFC. And after three years of having you here as a postdoctoral scholar, can you tell us a little bit about where you see the University of Calgary standing within this field of Israel studies today? 
Well, first, most of the research in the field of Israel studies um, takes place in the U.S., in Israel, obviously, and in Canada, the, we have Concordia University, where I was a postdoc before coming here, um, and University of Calgary. So this is already a great success. Um, so UFC and the Geneva Postdoc Program in Israel Studies is currently the only Canadian space that has both a Mizrahi and a gender perspective as the backbone of all the programs and projects uh, on Israel Studies. We are key partners uh, in some of the main conversations happening in Israel Studies through very specific initiatives. Um, UFC has a shared project that um, Sabrina mentioned that I uh, co-organize and co-coordinate with the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies at Brandeis University, which is argu arguably one of the most important institutions of uh, research on Israel Studies in North America. We are one of the two sponsors of the Sephardic Modernity Seminar Series, which has been exceptionally successful. We have hundreds of participants from all over the world, and it has become a highly, highly respected academic space. Um, and we have been very lucky to count on top ranking Israeli scholars, but not only Israeli, also North American scholars. This series ex explores a different approach to Jewish modernity by looking at the Sephardic world. And why? Because as I said, if we want to imagine a different future for Israel and hopefully a better one, we need to also tell a different, to look at Jewish history in a, in a different way and start looking at, at, at a history that sees Jews and Muslims as sharing a cultural space and Jews and Arabs as sharing a cultural space. And we have this history. This history is part of us as the Jewish people. Um, so this, is, this uh, series explores um, a world in which Jews were seen as indigenous to the Middle East um, and culturally close to, Jew to Arabs and Muslims. And the, we, the series explores also an experience of modernization that contradicts some, some of the most common assumptions uh, about Jewish modernization, which, is, which are basically based on the Ashkenazi experience. For example, um, we have explored how colonization played a, such a very important role in the alienation of Jews from the Middle East, um, and the separation between East and West, but also in the separation between Jews and Muslims. And my favorite, Sephardi ethnomusicology. Ah, yes. yes. Sephardi so musical traditions. Yes, that's been yeah. really, really fun yeah. and really popular. We brought yeah. Yair Dalal, who's a huge, huge Israeli musician, yeah. um, to close this year's series. That was really exciting. So that's one of the projects that the Jenny Buzzberg program is sponsoring now. And, and this is a key uh, project uh, within the field of Israel studies. In partnership with the Calgary Institute for in, the Humanities. In, in, of course, yes. in, in partnership with the Calgary Institute uh, yeah. for the Humanities. So we are also uh, sponsors of uh, the next conference on secularism, Mizrahim, and Israel uh, in 2024, which is going to take place in 2024 in Leipzig. The event is funded by the European Association of Jewish Studies, you know, University of, of Leipzig, and the Jenny Buzzer program. So the, given the alarming situation, uh, political situation in Israel today, um, this conference becomes particularly important. Mo one of the key questions that Israel needs to answer is whether you can be Jewish and democratic as a state. We are going to approach and this, this is the question that is being raised all the time in Israeli news, in the Knesset. In the, this is the question that everybody keeps discussing. So we are going to approach this question from the perspective of Mizrahi Jews and their own experiences with secularism in Israel. Um, we have already uh, gotten confirmation from very important Israeli voices like Yaakov Yadgar, David Ohana, or Sigalron, um, and they're, they're attending the, the conference. In short, 
UFC and the Jenny Belzer program are today key partners uh, of this academic platform and will hopefully, that will hopefully have a very long future. We are already planning another conference to, to take the, uh, place in Spain in two years in, about Israel, multiculturalism, and other Jewish origins such as Sephardat and Andalus, and I would love to see the program uh, participate in some way. Finally, um, the U UFC has joined the ranks of uh, North American universities offering an undergraduate course on women and Judaism, which is e e equally focused on uh, Israeli diversity from the perspective of women's movements and approaches to feminism beyond Western and secular conceptions of feminism. Besides introducing um, students to a gendered read of primary sources, the course is also an introduction to the diversity of feminisms in Israel um, and to the diversity of women's religion in Israel. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought up your course because I want to talk about this, about women. This is one of my favorite topics. And I think one of the um, exciting directions in Israel studies that, that we need to talk about. Um, you and I have often talked about how gendered spaces, particularly female spaces, were an important part of how we grew up. Um, those hours in the kitchen when it was just multiple generations. Um, so much of what we learned, so much of how we came to be in the world, um, happened in those women's spaces, which were full of food and singing and dancing and kisses and, and <laughs> wonderfulness. Um, these are also spaces of empowerment, but also critical places for the transmission of Sephardic culture. Um, and so I wanted to ask you sort of, what do you think are some of these exciting directions in Israel studies? Do you think the focus on women is a big one? Um, and then as a follow up, how does the work on women, um, particularly Sephardi women, um, who have often been seen as bastions of traditionalism, yeah. um, how does this fit into this work? So I think that in terms of the exciting directions of, uh, of Israel studies, one of the most uh, exciting ones, as I already mentioned, is the inclusion of Sephardi Mizrahi history. Uh, but also the inclusion of more ethnographic research, talking to people and including non-academic partners into our research, partnering with non-academics and research specifically focused, yes, on women, on Haredi women, women Palestinian women, Sephardic women, um, female writers. All this is happening now in the field and I think it's a critically important development. I personally am particularly excited about ethnographic work because that's what I love to do um, and the contribution of ethnography to the field. And the reason that I think this is a very exciting development is uh, because in order to understand Israeli society and its internal conflicts, uh, we need to understand how individuals build their identity, construct their, uh, their life in the social conditions they live in. And in order to understand that, we need to go and interview them and talk to them and include their voices in our research and take their voices at face value. So um, that's the way I, I, I approach ethnography from this perspective of um, taking the interviewees as partners and not only as sources of information, but literally as co-writers. Yeah. So the second question, don't forget that. So how does this work on women, Sephardi women? Um, how does this fit into this work? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about your new project. Yeah. So in, in my new project, which as Sabrina mentioned, has been funded by the Social Sciences um, and Humanities Research Council of Canada, I study the relation between migration, feminism, and, and Israeli identity from the perspective of Mizrahi women. Uh, the project has two interconnected themes. First, the development of Sephardi in, in, in Mizrahi feminism in the context of the Bet Midrash Arivot, um, which I belong to, in Jerusalem. It's the first Bet Midrash or house of study 
um, which is both Sephardi and feminist. Um, and I learned everything I know about feminism from these women. This is an intergenerational, uh, transgenerational bed midrash. We have women in their 90s and women in their 20s learning together Sephardic sources and discussing how the Sephardi sages are relevant for us today. We also include female and Sephardi female writers um, as part of those voices that we learn from. Um, but there's another aspect of the project that, in my opinion, is more interesting. And it's the fact that this feminism that we are trying to develop in this Bet Midrash also includes the voices of the mothers and the grandmothers. Um, we interview grandmothers, immigrants that came from Iraq, from Morocco, from Algeria into Israel, and who were perceived as being uneducated, backwards, primitive, as having nothing to offer to Israeli society. We interview them um, and we include them in our own theories about what it is to be a Sephardic woman in the 21st century. And we recover their traditions um, and their way of speaking as part of our own traditions today. So these women have traditionally been seen as only victims. And what we are trying to do is to reclaim their dignity and their position as partners. Yeah, I think it's interesting. We've also talked about how there is such a big change between like our generation and the generation of our grandmothers in terms of how they see themselves in society, how they position themselves, and, and how they, they declare their identity. Yeah. Um, I think this is really exciting. This you, You're really speaking to how empowering co-learning with non-academic partners, right? With people who aren't researchers, who are from communities, that kind of work, it's so empowering for everybody involved, but also that experience is critical for us to understand when it comes to moving Israel studies along. Yeah. A hundred percent. But I, I think that, um, and that's where I think the second part of my project is more interesting than the first one, at least for me, maybe because I've been working on the first part for a long time. But um, one, so I was in Israel doing field work last week, uh, last month. I, I came back a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, one of the women that we went to interview told me that she came, she came from a Bukharian family. And she told me that growing up, she was so embarrassed of uh, her mother's accent, um, her um, orientalism, her um, Arabness, even, even though she wasn't, but everything that seemed primitive, like it's her, her mother seemed primitive, foreign, um, and nothing to be proud of. Now that she's older and that she has begun to, rea to, to realize the value uh, of these traditions, her mother is no, no longer here. And, the, and her memories are filled, are, are mixed with shame. So uh, my, my, my project, which is, um, the, the second part of the project is based on uh, blessings. I explore the tradition of blessings and healing practices uh, among Sephardic women. What this project tries to do is to understand the ethics behind this tradition of blessings and healing practices. The ethics behind these women that pray for those they know and for those they don't know. Um, that to, what we do then is to bring them as legitimate agents and as having, and we let them teach us restoring their authority and in their place as agents in Israeli society, because they also have a story to tell about what it is to be Israeli, what it is to be an immigrant in Israel, what it is to be a Jew, um, and what it is to be a woman in Israel today. Because I, I think that there has been uh, a lot of emphasis on, on equality, which is very important in Israel society, but there's been less of an emphasis on the recognition of the diversity of Israeli society. Um, and Mizraki women specifically have been completely invisible. 
because they weren't perceived as having cultural assets. Uh, their traditions, their knowledge were not authorized. So that's what the project tries to do. Yeah, I love this idea of honoring grandmothers and, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things I'm, I'm really getting from this conversation um, is that the future of Israel studies is also about making a place for the Bukharian mother. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, to have a place uh, in a field that should be a multicultural space, that it doesn't get narrowed down, that Israel studies is recognized as a multicultural field. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Israel is indeed a multicultural country, and therefore, Israel studies needs to mirror that um, if we want to do anything relevant. <laughs> um, so, yes. Totally. Um, one of the challenges that the, that the state is facing right now is how, as I, as, as I mentioned, how to be Jewish and, and, and to be democratic. This, this discussion and all the possible answers are very well known, but it's enough with again like turning on the Israeli news. This is what is being discussed over and over again. However, there is another aspect that I am more interested in and that my project explores, which has to do with the distribution of symbolic capital in Israel. Um, meaning what what populations, what Israeli populations are thought to have value and are thought to be models, good models for Israel society, and which populations are not. What is the cultural model that Israel um, is, is following? I am interested in the cultural model proposed by dif different Sephardi intellectuals, but specifically by uh, an Egyptian Jewish writer called Jacqueline Shohet Kahanov. Um, she reclaimed the concept of Levantinism in Israel. She became a very famous uh, journalist in Israel after her migration to the country in the 1950s. Um, and she insisted on the importance of creating a cultural model or a, the, that the model of the Israeli should be a Levantine model, meaning in, the, in between East and West, in between um, e Europe and Asia, in between um, secular and religious, in this in-between space that has been so natural uh, for Mediterranean Jews for centuries and has been exceptionally successful. Um, this is, uh, so this model for who this uh, Israeli person would be is, uh, is someone who has a very, very long tradition in the, in the area. Someone who speaks Hebrew, Arabic, Turkish, French, English, Italian, um, of course, Ladino. Uh, this is a, a story or a background where that can serve Israel very well in order to imagine uh, a different and better future, one that is not necessarily marked by violence. And uh, I'm not saying that this. Uh, that this story was necessarily ideal. What I'm saying is that we can draw a lot of inspiration uh, from it in order to imagine um, a different place for, for Israel in the near future. We're going to wrap this up because I want to open up to uh, questions from the audience. Um, but before we do that, I want to ask you, what are your plans for the future? Um, so what are, you do, what are you up to after you leave this place? And what do you see as your lasting contribution as a scholar of Israel studies? So I'm going to be um, starting a position in Madrid, um, funded by the Rothschild um, Foundation of uh, Jewish Studies in, um, in Europe. The position is uh, for me to develop Jewish studies at Complutense University of uh, Madrid. And uh, it's a very exciting project because uh, even though Spain is, uh, has a, an obviously critical place in Jewish history as the cradle of Sephardi, Spain does not have uh, Jewish studies. 
as a consequence of a very long anti-Semitic tradition and um, and repression of Spanish Jewish past. So it's a very exciting uh, initiative to be speaking about not only medieval Jews, because that's what Spaniards love to do, Jews that are not alive anymore, but also to speak about the the present of, um, so, uh, of, of Sephardic communities, the present uh, of Israel, and to speak about uh, Jewish studies as something lively that has to do with the present and not only with the past. Um, so that's something that I'm going to be uh, what I'm going to be doing in, in a few months. And to me, the what what I would love to to do was to is to continue to be able to coordinate some at least some of the programs that I'm uh, coordinating now um, as part of the Geneva program, and and uh, to see. Uh, the the future of uh, these programs is intertwined with the future of Israel studies in, at U of C. Um, hopefully, yeah, we can find ways of staying in contact and partnering. Thank you so much for an incredibly rich conversation. Um, I can sincerely say that this has been a wonderful time having you here. I'd like to ask everyone to join me in another round of applause for Dr. <laughs>